My village is called Jayus, located in Kalkilia district in the northern of the West Bank. You can see uh, maybe from here the settlement in the, uh, there. It, there it, it is a uh, for Jayus land. There is uh, near to three or four settlements here. Do you like to go to the gate? The Israeli government announced the construction of the wall in 2002. So uh, everyone, when he, he wants to go to his land, he must have a permit. And in this time, it is very hard to get a permit. It is safe for you, maybe we can tell if they ask you that you go there to take a photos only. Yeah. This is the time for the gate to open and uh, for the farmers to go out. They say there is a problem for the army and they close this ga the gate. They close the gate and there are some farmers they waiting for them to open the gate again. She is one from the EABBI, they attend of this case. They came to the gate to see when the, the, when the farmer they have any problem. And they know some organization that they can help in this case. She's from Swiss. She's a good friend. They open it now. Oh, they open good. it again. I called the hotline. Maybe they call them. Maybe, because they was been the allowed for one. And after that, they close the gate. All of the people here in the village, they don't agree this wall. So they start making a demonstration. When the army saw the people, they arrived there, they start uh, tire gas. And they start uh, uh, arresting some of the, of the people. And uh, sometimes also they shooting uh, uh, robot uh, life for the people. After we have this demonstration, the most of the days the, the army they came and they make curfew in the village. spend sometimes all the day and sometimes 10 hours and they don't allow for anyone to go out and they close all the shops and uh, nobody he can go out for pray or for anything they told him close the door and go inside he said that everyone you must stay at home is better because uh, uh, for Jews people you must stay at home it could be better for you, uh, yourself Sometimes that uh, when they want to arrest some people, they make a curfew and they don't allow for anyone to go out. And mm -hmm. if they catch anyone out, they put handcuffs in his hand and they took him. And like you hear now, don't uh, worry, the uh, tire uh, sound bump many times. Mm -hmm. And they came in the middle of the night and they, they tire like this sound bump and in the houses also. life in this situation. Uh, the way it is taught to us in our history classes, it's almost as if our grandparents came to an empty land and settled there. Um, have you ever heard the expression, a land without a people for a people without a land? So this is sort of uh, kind of inaccurate, actually, uh, because there were people there. They were called the Palestinians.
being a Zionist, um, I didn't offer any other kind of uh, worthy solution or alternative to, to the people who were living here before. Okay, you don't accept this, but what you do to make a difference? What is your life means if you don't try to make a change? What exactly is this occupation that we're talking about? What do we mean when we say that Palestine is occupied? So now we're going into the West Bank, into Area C, which is under full Israeli control. red triangle in this map, this is a map of the, a large map of the West Bank, represents a permanent checkpoint. There are also hundreds of flying checkpoints. Um, there's a common myth that, uh, uh, or idea, um, that uh, checkpoints are between Palestine and Israel, between the West Bank and Israel, um, um, trying to protect people from, Palestinians from coming into Israel. But actually 80% of checkpoints are within the West Bank itself. We talked a lot about uh, the, the checkpoints controlling movement. The wall is an indispensable part of this system of control. because it's not on the Green Line. It doesn't encompass all the settlements. And settlements on both sides of the wall are growing. So it's basically a, a barrier, a separation barrier for people. So at this point, this side of the wall is uh, municipal Jerusalem, according to Israel. And the other side is Area B of the Palestinian Authority. Well, it's of course a very uh, difficult position for the Palestinians, but it's a necessary evil because it protects Israeli citizens from Palestinian terrorists. On this side we're on Abu Dis, on that side we're on Abu Dis. So they're not separating here between Jews and Arabs, they're separating between Arabs and Arabs. And so you'd be arguing that the Arabs on that side of the wall are somehow more dangerous than the Arabs on this side of the wall. It's the same neighborhood on both sides of the wall here. I mean, this is an or a neighborhood that grew organically. I used to go shopping there a lot. A lot of people from Jerusalem did. Things were a bit cheaper, get your car fixed and so on. Now there's, there's no access um, other than going through the checkpoint around. You speak to most Israelis, they've heard of it, they've seen it on television, Sometimes, some of them have seen pictures, but you don't feel it on the landscape. For Palestinians, these borders are very, very real and very palpable. We're about five kilometers from the Green Line, so we're already about a quarter of the way into the West Bank, and yet this is still municipal Jerusalem. The way the government defines Jerusalem, and I'll show you later on the map, is, uh, is quite convoluted. I mean, the, the Greater Jerusalem actually covers almost 10% of the West Bank.
represents today uh, a, a line of compromise that the Palestinians have by and large agreed upon for, for recognition um, uh, of Israel and peace with Israel and normalized relations with Israel. The Saudi plan um, is a unanimous plan agreed upon by all 22 Arab countries um, that they will normalize relations with Israel uh, if, they, if they establish a Palestinian state on the Green Line. So every time you build over the Green Line, um, you're basically uh, violating um, this, this, this possibility of, of compromise with the, the Palestinians. And it's actually a rather generous plan given that 78% of the land would go to, to Israel. And you see, the, the master plan for Malaya Dumim, which is a big settlement we're going to visit next, it goes in this little finger almost all the way to Jericho. Although Malaya Dumim, the built up area, is just here, they have a master plan. So you see, this could be Miami Beach, you know, with the palm trees and, and the infrastructure. It's, uh, it's a very pleasant place to live. settlement that was started in the late 70s. It started as an ideological settlement. Um, eventually, the Israeli government uh, started to take part in it and subsidize houses. There are 40,000 people living here now. There are plans to expand it up until 150. It's a no-brainer for most people. Cheap housing, out in the hills, in the fresh air, um, government subsidies. Why not? Why not? So essentially what we're doing is kind of layering one state on top of another, in a sense. With all the Jewish settlements with about half a million settlers living in them, all connected by, by settler roads which link into the Israeli highway system. I mean, the kind of investment we've made in the West Bank is not the kind of investment that a country makes if it intends to pull out. But we're creating an infrastructure for a de facto single state. When a Palestinian says, my home was demolished, and a, another Palestinian said, I lost my ID, and another Palestinian said, I, I can't find work. It's not just these kind of isolated cases of injustice or you know, one Israeli who's, who's racist or 10 Israelis who are racist. There's this idea of on the, on the governmental level, uh, on, the, on the political policy level of dispossession, of economic depression, in addition to fight, fighting the humanitarian fallout from, from these policies, is to actually make this into a political struggle against the Israeli government and Jerusalem, the Jerusalem municipalities, very directed racism toward the native inhabitants of, of this land. In terms of understanding the fundamental of, of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, it's really the fact that Israel today controls 100% of historic Palestine. So in other words, if you're going to reconcile the two competing nationalisms of Zionism or Jewish nationalism and Palestinian nationalism, you obviously can't have a situation where one side controls 100% of the land. And that's what Israel has done since 1967 when it occupied the Palestinian West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip, in which it continues to do today. We didn't become more secure. We didn't become more safe with what, the way things are going on now. And without developing dialogue with our neighbors, with our enemies, without considering what um, the creation of, the, of Israel in 48 did to the population that was already living here, without considering that, without discussing that, without recognizing the fact that there, there, are, there was another history uh, there's other countries that live around us that really aren't interested in, in waging war with us. And that we have to solve our differences with the Palestinians, some way, one way or another. أتيبي حبيبي شو قصتك United States United States
If they come to Hebron and see what's going on, they will change their attitude. They divided the city for two parts because of 500 settlers. I remember the market when I was a child. It was full of people, full of uh, open shops, full of life. Now, I don't see, and I don't see that there is a life here. It's, it's completely empty, the area here. I was born in the old city. And my house is a close military zone here, where I was born. I am against everybody who believes in killing the other. Sometimes I feel sorry for even seeing a soldier suffering, not a civilian, a soldier. Because I see that soldier is a civilian from inside. I look to the people from inside. We are equal. We are human, as everybody in the world. What about our rights? We are below uh, Beit Hadassah settlement. In spite of the presence of the soldiers all over here and the cameras, but the settlers are uh, continuing throwing stones and attacking the people from up, and especially the people who are walking here. So the municipality put this fence to protect the Palestinians from the stones, from the empty bottles, from uh, the settlers' attack from up. The shops here were closed and welded by the army. Uh, Twelve shops here. From 1,800 shops were closed because of the closure policy in Hebron. And the settlers, they occupied the roofs and they created a kindergarten on the, on the roofs. And they created a playground for the settlers on, the, on these roofs, which is completely Palestinian and which is completely illegal, even uh, by the Israeli law. The soldiers all the time uh, are here. Protecting whom, I don't know. But it's a closure policy, it's occupation policy. To have soldiers, to have police, to have uh, settlers in, in the middle of Hebron. Here it used to be Hebron. If you talk about Hebron, that you have to come here. All the parking, all the kind of shops, the wholesale market, as I told you, were here. No, now the settlers only are allowed to be here. This is one of the entrance of Shohada Street, which closed completely for the Palestinians. The army, they use it just to go outside to attack houses and to search the Palestinian houses outside the restricted area. Care about the others, the others will care about you. I care about them because I have some Israeli friends, they care about me. If I feel sick, I, they will call me and ask what's going on. If the settlers attack me, they will, uh, will call me and ask what's going on. We are sorry. But the other Palestinians who are really suffering from the settlers, they don't have anybody from Israel care about them. I hope that all the Israeli, they push the government to stop this violation because it's affecting, uh, affecting them in an indirect way. Nobody in Israel asked himself why the Palestinian they hit a uh, Jewish. Why the Palestinian throw stones or why some suicide bombers they go to Tel Aviv. This is the reasons. As a Palestinian, I don't see that uh, an excuse to be violent, but I can understand it. Go to the roots to any problem, you can solve it. 600 checkpoints in the West Bank, all the single details 
of dehumanizing in your daily life, do you need anybody to teach you how to hate Israel? If you grow up in such conditions, you don't need that. You don't need a specific curriculum for hatred. It will do the job for you. We are pushing the Palestinians into a corner where they have nothing to lose. And there's nothing more dangerous than an enemy who has nothing to lose. Things can't get any worse. I might as well blow myself up. That is, that's the worst of the worst. Doing these things, you have to justify them to yourself only by saying, the, oh, these people only understand force. We have to show them who's boss. They're not really like us, they're second class, they're in some way to dehumanize them. It has a lot to do with the politics of fear, which, uh, considering the history of the Jewish people, and particularly of the recent generations, it's not that difficult to uh, evoke fear and panic in the Israeli uh, uh, population. People are fearful for their lives. Uh, there's a common belief that we are one little country and we're surrounded by a lot of enemies. And their desire is to push us into the sea. But you can't have security while you're oppressing people because people will always resist their oppression. If not, they're not fully human beings. If not, they're servile. And Palestinians are not servile and they're never going to accept a condition of permanent oppression by Israel. The media show the Palestinians as only capable of throwing stones or burning tires or exploding themselves, as if we are born with genes of hatred or violence. Nobody is born with genes of hatred or violence. Nobody is born to hate. Is a society choose to focus on the people that uh, hate people? and she don't focus at all on other people. Um, so the picture that the, uh, the picture that the normal Israeli gets from the TV or the press or books or the discussion around him is just focus on the, the people that hate him and not the people that don't. Palestinians are not angels, but uh, we're a nation seeking freedom and independence. And this is what, what is now seen as illegitimate by many others was legitimate 60 years ago. I mean, when there were so many countries under occupation, they were fighting in all ways possible. And so we're doing the same, basically. So I decided to, to, start, to start the contacts with the Israelis because I, I realized that there is some good Israelis that we can talk to. It started about four years ago, struggle against the separation fence, which is uh, cutting half of the village uh, lands in order to build on them the settlement Modin Elite, which is built on the lands of uh, the villages around. And uh, about two years ago, the highest court uh, gave a verdict that, uh, that, 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 that the road of the separation fence is not for security, it's for annexation, and that it must be moved uh, to give back half the lands. But uh, till now, nothing was happened. Still have to change the road. And we continue demonstration. It is a symbol now in all Palestine. Berlin is the symbol. This is the only one that uh, continue without uh, without cessation for already far, four years. Nonviolence is a very great tool which the Palestinians use in the first intifada. Our nature is the nonviolence. Even politically, I cannot take a revenge because Palestine for me is not a case of revenge. It's a case of right. As a human being, first of all, not even as a Palestinian. 
We want our kids to be aligned in and to grow up on nonviolent resistance. This means that you will have a, a new generation who believes in nonviolent and they are able to have their rights. I believe that if you want to use force, then you are weak. I don't believe at all that violent or military resistance will lead us for a solution as Palestinians. So the idea of creating the beautiful resistance against the ugliness of occupation and its violence as a way to break these cultural stereotypes and to show another image of Palestine, to reclaim and defend this beauty and the humanity and culture that we have in ourselves. This nonviolence that is practiced since years, years, years. I think it's becoming increasingly difficult for Israel to maintain this facade of innocence and victimhood. And that's both within the general population in the United States and also amongst Jewish Americans. And I think that that kind of mainstream discourse has cracked wide open in recent years. Following the 2006 uh, Israeli war on Lebanon, and more importantly in terms of changing public perceptions, Israel's 2008 to 2009 war on the Gaza Strip really opened up a lot of people's eyes to the re really brutal nature of Israeli policy towards Palestinians. And Israel and its supporters in the United States are fearing right now that they're losing the discourse battle. The struggle is being seen more in the light of self-determination, of freedom, of independence, and that Israel is blocking these things uh, from being uh, achieved for the Palestinian people. I think that the history of oppression that Jews have faced throughout the millennia can be interpreted in one of two ways for contemporary Jews around the world. Either the message is, terrible things were done to us and we were oppressed, so we shouldn't do the same things to other people and we should work for a world in which that type of oppression doesn't take place to anyone. Or the other lesson that can be learned is that, well, this is the way the world works and, you know, it just is this way and that therefore let's not be stupid and let's be strong and let's do what everyone else does. So I think there's two ways of, of learning this lesson and I see, I, I believe that within the Jewish community, especially you're seeing this today within divisions in the Jewish American community, you can definitely see that split shaping up in terms of how Jewish Americans relate to Israel and its policies. Was there a protest at all? No, because uh, they know that the, the demonstration starts every Friday after uh, they finish the break. Uh -huh. So they came before this uh, Friday because they don't want anyone to go there. And they say it is fair to They don't allow to, uh, even for the people to go to pray. And do you see when they make the careful that we are stay like we are staying in jail? Nobody can go. We are not free. We cannot go to to continue our work. We cannot go to work. 
just we can stay all the time in the house and it is really we are feel boring over that because it is also not one day the most of the days they came and they make care of the sound bump You think that the army they came because of the stones? They came because you know, they know that uh, you know that we are here. We don't have weapon to fight the army. Just we can make the uh, fight him with the, the stones, and the stones make nothing for the jeep or for the army. But they, maybe they thought that if we start throwing a stone after that, that we will start of other thing, start uh, fighting him of weapon or something. So if anyone th throw stone, they came and they took him to jail. We wish this incubation will be in. And everything there is in for everything. And I wish it will be soon, the end of the incubation. <laughs>